Welcome yet again to one of our English classes. Today we'll be delving into something very important and that has to do with writing. For quite some time we've been doing justice to grammar, vocabulary and um, orals. So today we want to look at something a bit different, very important like I said because it carries you all through life. All right, so today we'll be looking at summary writing, summary writing, very vital. Um, I doubt if there is any exam you would want to embark on as um, a student that you wouldn't be asked to make an attempt in summary writing or comprehension. So it's necessary we look at the topic and be intimated on it. All right, so we'll kick off by looking at our lesson objectives, or what we also call learning objectives. So we'll actually define summary writing, outline the important facts on summary writing, writing, outline the steps on how to write a good summary, how to put down summary answers, and obviously look at reasons why students tend to um, fail in summary writing or have reduction of mark or deduction of mark in summary writing. All right, so we'll start off by defining summary. All right, so basically, uh, before we go to what, what we have here, basically you would agree with me that once someone says summarize, all what you're letting the person um, know is that you want him or her to bring whatever he or she is saying right to a close to precise it to concise it that's basically what summary entails bringing something to a nutshell permit me to use that word bringing it to a nutshell that means you're bringing whatever thing you have how cumbersome how verbose it may be you want to bring it to concisement you want to make it shorter than it was all right, so when we talk about summary, literally, we are referring to bringing something that seems big to become small, making something big to be small. So now we want to look at summary in respect to writing now. And we say that summary involves writing down a brief and concise account of a long passage. That's um, the formal definition of summary. It involves writing down a brief and concise account of a long passage so obviously in an exam condition a passage will be given to you with a particular title be it subtitles or a general title and you'll be left to read it and be able to summarize depending on the nature you are asked to summarize your work sometimes you could be asked to do a sentence summary all right, where you are asked to write in two sentences, in three sentences, or in four sentences. And remember, once you are asked to write in sentences, remember that once you observe a full stop, you have made a sentence. All right, so when you are asked to write in two sentences or three sentences, know it that these sentences will come one after the other. They will not be on the same line. But there is yet another type of summary approach where you will be asked to do continuous writing summary. In that type of summary writing, you write in sentences, no doubt, in a mixture of varying sentence types, but it has to be continuous. When we talk about continuous writing, it will obviously come in the nature of the passage given to you, but this time around, you have to bring, it, bring out the key words needed, leaving aside irrelevant things from the passage and hitting on the relevant things you've been asked to summarize on. So we have the continuous writing summary and we have the sentence writing summary. Whichever you are asked to write on, know it that you have to make it brief. You have to make it concise. You have to bring it to a nutshell. So that's why we say that summary involves writing down brief and concise account on a long passage. Now, the passage that you will be reading or you will read will definitely be long. But once you're doing your summary, your summary has to be short. So if your summary is not shorter than the original work, 
let it be said now that you have not actualized the act of summary writing and obviously marks will be reduced for you so in other words summary can be described as an abridged form of a long passage after removing all irrelevant points from the main points and giving a precise account of the passage using your own words this is very important you must use your own words that's where you prove to the examiner that you actually understood the passage that's one thing about using your own words now when you see certain words that ought to be changed you could actually change those words then go ahead and change those words it tells the examiner that the passage was well grasped by you as a, as a candidate or as a student so you must have it at the back of your mind that summary has to be short it has to be concise it has to be abridged it has to be in a nutshell and most importantly they must come in your own words now where you feel that a particular word if being changed could alter the original meaning that the passage has in mind then it is okay for you to leave it the way it is but you could actually restructure your sentence type all right so we'll look at important facts about summary writing now before we go into important facts about summary writing i would like to hit something and that is um, the fact that summary is different from paraphrasing now i hear people sometimes say i have paraphrased and they use it synonymous to summary summary and paraphrasing are quite different things they are different in nature why summary has to be an abridged part of a passage or bringing a passage to a concise form now paraphrasing on its own can come in two forms paraphrasing can be using your own words all right in writing a passage but it can be equal to the original text paraphrasing can be equal to the original text even while you've used your own words it can be equal to the original text or shorter than the original text but when it comes to summary summary must be shorter than the original text where your summary is equal to the original text then you actually haven't done anything to a large extent your summary should be 15 percent yes 10 to 15 percent of the original work so if you have more than 10 to 15 percent of the original work as summary done then you have not done summary but for paraphrasing it can go further than 10 to 15 percent it can be 10 to 15 it can also be more than 15 like i said paraphrasing can be equal to the original text but your choice of words have to be different from that of the original all right having established this fact about summary being different from paraphrasing let's now look at important facts about summary writing what are those things that i have to know what are those things you have to know as a student as long as summary writing is concerned now the first point of call is brevity when we talk about brevity we talk about the, the shortness of a work of art you have to be as brief as possible you don't need to show your skill in writing when it comes to summary writing you want to show your skill in writing you want to show how much words you are loaded with then do justice to that when you are exposed to compositions letter writing but as long as summary writing is concerned you have to be brief that's why we have the word brevity you have to be brief in your writing brief in your choice of words brief in your language use now it is out of place for you to have a high falutin word in a passage and you also use a more high falutin word just to tell the examiner that you understood what the writer has in mind but it is expected of you as the name suggests summary to bring to a nutshell to reduce whatever high falutin words you have in the passage so you have to use clear language you have to use clear words words that will explain to another person what you have read from the original now there's something i want to point out to know you to let you know how important it is for you to use normal language use now you went for a program and you're back from that program somebody spoke on a particular topic and here you are in the midst of people and you are asked to summarize what you have learned imagine using high falutin words by high falutin words i mean using words 
that would take your listeners hard. It would take them so much time to understand what you're saying. If you have read some works of certain writers, you agree with me that you must have a dictionary by your side while reading their works. Now, that is not what is expected of you when you're doing your summary writing. You're expected to use words at its barest minimum. So using words that at its barest minimum means using words that can be easily understood by anybody. So brevity, this demands that students must be brief and concise in their answers. You just have to be brief and concise, straight to the point. You don't need to pick words here and there just to make your work cumbersome, no. Just be brief and be concise. So there is no room for the use of highfalutin. Highfalutin words are verbose words. They are what we call ambiguous words. When somebody says that something is ambiguous, it's complex. It's hard to understand. So there is no room for use of highfalutin words. Please, you have your vocabularies, high-sounding words. Keep them by the side. That's not the time to use it, not when you're writing your summary. All right, so there is no room for the use of highfalutin language or any extra information aside from the main points. Please do not bring in your own idea. You have read a passage on um, maybe robots, and you, you find out that at the verge of reading the, the passage, there were informations that you are aware of that were not mentioned. All right, some, informa some information that you know about robots that were not mentioned in the passage and you are asked a question relating to that, you feel you want to show how much you are, you know, exposed, all right, to robots and how they function and you choose to put in your own idea other than the idea that is in the passage, trust me, you will be penalized. So please restrict your knowledge on the information given to you in the passage. Paradventure, you are asked as part of a question to give your own opinion. Uh-huh. That way you can bring in your opinion. But where your opinion is not sought for, please do well not to give yours. All right? The next point is relevance. Your summary must have relevance. This calls for a student's answers to be relevant to the points mentioned in the passage. So please do not give, do, you're not expected to give any fact or point not mentioned. I think I've also explained it while talking about brevity. So do not give points that are not mentioned in the passage. However important it is, however important you think that fact is or that point is, please do not bring it in. It's just like writing your letter, writing, and you're asked to write on a particular topic to an extent you decided to deviate a little just to bring in something that was not asked. That's how people fail in an exam. So once you are writing your summary, have it at the back of your mind. That summary demands you giving information as given to you, except where you are asked to give an extra information. So as long as you are not asked by the examiner, there shouldn't be reason for you to include your view about a particular thing or what you think you know about it. Now we look at proper coverage of the passage. Proper coverage of the passage. This entails that students must read and understand every aspect of the passage. There should be proper coverage. Do not go in for uh, an exam on summary writing and you decide to just pick the answers without having proper coverage. You have to read the passage in total. You have to read the passage holistically, get your information about the passage and identify key things that will be expected of you. That way, you will be able to approach the questions very well. So this calls for proper understanding of the passage since the passage is unlikely to lend itself to them. Yet, there are some passages that you will look at at a glance if it has a title. With a title, you could depict or you could tell to a large extent what that passage is. But where the passage is unlikely to expose itself to you, then you have to read everything. And that is why when we'll be looking at one of the outlines, the lesson objectives, you will come to a point where we'll see the way to approach summary writing and 
step-by-step -step approach to summary writing. So if you have a, a passage before you, the onus is on you if you really wish to have your full mark on summary writing. The onus is on you to go through the passage, if possible, three times before you engage yourself in answering the questions. So the, the, you have to read the passage properly, assimilate the passage, get yourself abreast with the topic and what the topic is all about before you start answering. Then finally, we have clarity. We have clarity. It says this means that students are expected to pull down their answers clearly. If you do not put your answers down clearly, you will obviously be losing out. So these are important facts you have to know. You have to be brief in, in, in your summary writing. You, you need to have a, a, a relevance. That means you have to put what is given. Do not give what is not given. Your answers to summary questions have to be relevant to the topic given. Do not give in answers as chosen, but give the answers by the questions asked and restrictions given should be respected. Then there should be proper coverage. Do well to read the passage and in its entirety and understand what the passage is all about. Then finally, you have to be clear enough in your answers, clear in words, clear in spelling, clear in grammar, clear in your use of tenses. This will always go a long way to give you your full mark. Now let's look at the next outline. It says steps on how to write a good summary. I need us to pay attention. Steps to, on how to write a good summary. Now before I go through what I have, I would like to say that we must never be in a hurry when attempting summary questions. Now when you've been exposed to your paper one, where you have comprehension, letter writing, and summary writing, you know the particular question that you will approach and you will, you will feel relaxed while doing it. It is important that you approach that very question first. Now, having letter writing, comprehension, and summary, if you know that comprehension is usually easy for you, go ahead and do it. Finish it as fast as possible. Then go to the next question that you're conversant with. If it's letter writing, fine. Then comprehension, you come to summary where you will give yourself an ample time to go through it. Remember, summary writing has the highest mark. Summary writing has the highest mark. While others are 20, 20, summary writing is 30 marks. All right? So you can't afford to lose such, and you can't afford to fail so much. So let's look at how to write a good summary, steps on how to write a good summary. Now, writing a good summary entails that you read the passage very well so as to have an in-depth understanding of it before attempting to put down your answers. Very important. Oh, I'm, I'm good at answering summary questions. Remember, it's different from when you are in school and when you are in an, ex an external exam condition. So many factors could weigh you down at that point. So do not think it's one of those summary passages your teacher gives you in school where the atmosphere is friendly. This could be a different passage altogether. So don't approach it just anyhow. You're expected to have an in-depth understanding. If you read it once, there are people, depending on their skill, there are people who could go through it once and they already have the general information they, they need. And there are people, abilities differ. There are people who would have to read two, three times before they could get it. Now, sometimes I tell my students, first point of call, read it in a hurry. When you read it in a hurry, go to the question, run through the questions, go back to read it. At the point of reading the second time, get hold of your pencil, because you obviously wouldn't use a pen so that you won't be tagged to have tried to engage in exam practice. Get hold of your pencil, begin to underline key words or key things. Possible questions you have still have in your memory as you have read, begin to underline them so that when you finally come back to answer the questions properly, you have leeway on how to tackle the questions. 
So let's look at what we have here. Now the following should be put into cognizance. You want to perfect in your summary writing, you want to give write a good summary, then these are things we must put into consideration. Now, first says, read the passage very quickly to know the subject matter of the passage. Read it very quickly. You know, when you're reading a novel in a hurry, read it that way. Read it very quickly just to know the subject matter. Whichever way you read it, you will definitely know what that message, the passage is all about. Is it talking about contemporary issues? Is it discussing um, the use of gadgets? Is it about Christianity? Is it about colonization? There should be something that you will know why, when reading it in a hurry, the subject matter must be God. That way, you know what, you have an inkling on where the passage is heading to. Now, after reading it in a hurry, what's the second thing? After the first reading, a second reading should be done so as to intimate oneself with the subject matter of the passage. Remember in the first reading, you've gotten what the subject matter is. Is it colonization? I've gotten the subject matter. That is what it is. Is it on hatred? Is it on transgender? Is it on gender differences, gender inequality? You've gotten what the, the subject matter is. That was just what you did while reading the first time. But this second time, you want to abreast yourself with the subject matter. Oh, the topic or uh, the subject matter is on um, gender inequality. Let me look at it now. Don't believe that gender inequality has to be the aspect of the male gender being against the female gender. What if the write-up is about female gender being superior to the male gender, looking at it from that angle? So you don't quickly conclude because you feel you have an inkling of what the subject matter is all about. So your second reading, it will be done with rapt attention, all right? Exposing you to the real issues dealt on in respect to the subject matter. So that was why we said the second reading should be done, should be done so as to intimate you, sorry for this, to be, to intimate you with the subject matter of the passage. Now what's the third thing we have to do? Proceed to reading the questions as this will provide an insight to what you will now focus your attention on when you are reading the third time. That's the third thing you have to do. When you have read the, the passage in a hurry, that's your first reading, you're reading it in a hurry to know what the subject matter, that's the theme, you want to know what it's all about. Having gotten what the subject matter is on, then you move to the second reading. Now in the second reading, you want to get yourself abreast. You want to have an in-depth knowledge of um, the general thing that the subject matter is about. So once you are done with that, run through the questions. It is necessary that you go through the questions if at this point you still have not assimilated the passage so well. Go through the questions. Obviously, summary questions are usually not much. At most, two or three questions, yes. If it's for the YEC, at most three questions or two questions, depending. So sometimes you have just one question. So you go through the question, know what the question is about or questions are on, then come back for your third reading. Why doing the third reading, you're expected to a large extent identify answers to certain questions that you have been asked. So proceed to reading these questions as this will provide an insight to what you will focus your attention on when you are reading the third time. Then reread the passage for the third time and you can underline or note where the needed information for answering your questions are. That's just it. Underline. Use your pencil to underline. Yes, you're reading, you begin to underline, you, you will under, see key things. Because in, in reading your questions, look out for key words in your questions. These key words are what you will look out for in your comprehension, in your summary passage. So once you have your keywords from the questions, you trace your keywords where they are in the passage and begin to identify possible answers, having assimilated what the passage is all about. 
then you should, of course, go back to the questions after the third reading to answer them. So that is it. When you have read the third time, you can now begin to go to your questions to answer them properly. By then, you have underlined certain key things, and they will help you trace the answers appropriately. Please, the essence of reading the whole passage is for you to know that there is always a possibility for answers to be where they are. You could see a particular thing that looks like an answer, but basically may not be the answer. So you have to read the whole passage. Get yourself acquainted with the whole passage before you begin to answer your questions. Now, how do we put down summary answers? How do we put down summary answers? Do we just write? When I started earlier, I made mention of something I told us that there are certain summary uh, questions that would come as continuous writing. Questions, yes, that would come as continuous writing. And in answering them, you answer them as continuous writing. By continuous writing, I mean writing them in the way the, the passage is. But at this point, it has to be shorter while addressing the very question that you have been asked. Again, I said that there are summary answers that you approach by writing in sentences. They say in five sentences, what are the varying points given for problem in Nigeria? Then you begin to write in sentences. But where you are not asked to write in sentence, you are asked to summarize the problems um, faced by Nigerian youths. That's continuous writing. All right? Remember, in continuous writing, you ap apply your sentence types. You, you could use your simple sentence, mix it with, mix up with um, complex, with compound complex, and with compound sentence. But in um, sentence writing summary, you only use writing sentences, simple sentences, basically, or somehow the complex sentence or the compound complex. But hardly would you use, sorry, the compound sentence. Hardly would you use the compound com complex in answering your summary questions. But if it's for continuous writing summary questions, then all of the sentence types could be applied. All right, so let's look at how to put down summary answers. The first point of call is that we must write in sentences. Your summary has to be written in sentences because sentence expresses, sentences express thoughts. So if you write in phrases, it wouldn't make sense. So for our Wayek basis, you have to write in sentences. Summary answers should be written in sentences. When the student writes in preamble to, ans to his answers, the preamble should flow into the sentence. Preamble is like an introduction, right? That's an introduction. You have been asked to give, write five sentences on the issues bordering Nigerian youths. Now, the preamble to giving these five sentences would be the problems bordering Nigerian youths are, that was why we say that the preamble should flow into the sentence. So once you've written the problems bordering Nigerian youths are, that means are they, okay, are lack of infrastructure. These are problems bordering Nigerian youths. Problems bordering Nigerian youths are one, lack of infrastructure. That's number one. Number two, inability for government to provide um, skills for them to learn. That's another problem. So you see that once you read the preamble, it flows into each of the answers. But you choose not to write your use write in sentences using preamble to flow in. You could start off with your preamble and run with it. You write in sentences one of the problems that border Nigerian youth is lack of infrastructure. Another problem is um, uh, lack of manpower to do work. These are things you would write. So it depends on the choice, either to use the preamble, but if you're not good at using preamble and making sure that your preamble will flow into the sentences, then it's good you write your answers in full sentences, not using your preamble, like the second example I gave. Now, what's the second way is that your answers, how to put down your summary answers, your answers has to be short, it has to be concise. Please, your answer has to be short, 
and concise. On no account should you make your answers lengthier than necessary. It shouldn't be too long. Because looking at what summary is, remember we said that summary has to do with bringing a passage to its barest minimum. All right? Making it short, making it brief. So at the point of giving your answers, your answers have to be brief as well. So summary answers should be short and concise. It says we should avoid inclusion of materials that are irrelevant. Extra work, it's not needed. We don't need extra work. We don't need extra information. Limit your answers to what you have been given. And when you do so, you will obviously make it short. It's when we feel we want to begin to express ourselves. That is when we have too much to write. Remember, always have it at the back of your mind. Summary has to be do it something short in a nutshell. So if something has to be in a nutshell, I must do well not to include extraneous materials all right point number three says use your own words please do well to use your own words reason you should um study your vocabulary i would advise you learn new words every day and lighter words to use for heavier words okay so when you use your own words you tell the examiner one thing that you understood the passage and you're able to answer appropriately so using your own words will help a long way to gain you the needed marks. All right, it says, in writing down your answers, make use of your own words and expressions as much as, as, much as possible. All right, that was why I said at the initial time that where you know if you tamper with a particular word, the original meaning will not be passed across. Then you could actually retain that word. But where you can change, then you must change. That way you are giving a right impression to the examiner about yourself. You are not expected to engage in mindless lifting of words and expression, lifting of words that are not necessary. You keep lifting verbatim. You give everything the way the examiner has written it. It is not appropriate. Finally, use good grammar. All right? Use good grammar. Use your concord appropriately. Where you're supposed to use is, use is. Make use of the right tenses. Don't use um, present when it's meant to be past. Don't use present continuous when it's meant to be past continuous. Then your expressions must be appropriate. So make sure your answers are devoid of grammatical and expression errors. You would also lose mark when mistakes are found. Yes, when mistakes are found, that results to loss of marks. Then let's look at causes of loss of marks in summary writing. Losses of loss of marks. Obviously, if you keep to the rules that guide summary writing, I don't see any reason why you should lose marks. But that notwithstanding, let's look at the possible things that could make us lose marks in summary writing. I told us 30 marks, it's not um, a play thing. At least if one is getting 28, you have done justice well enough, all right? So let's look at mindless lifting of a passage is one cause of loss of mark in summary writing. You just copy everything, that's mindless, you don't mind. You just, a question is asked, the answer is there, you know this is the answer, but nothing stops you from, you know, understanding the answer and choosing your words to write the answer, but you decide to take the answers the way they are. In the passage, that is what we refer to mindless lifting. You know, when they said that she wrote verbatim, you are writing an exam, and if somebody wants to copy from you, the person copies exact thing. That's what we refer to as verbatim. So, when you're doing your, your summary writing, you are not expected to copy verbatim, you are expected to give answers in your own words. All right, so using the exact words and expression of the writer it's referred to as mindless lifting the exact words of the writer or expressions everything written as it is you pen it down that way all right next we have absence of conciseness and relevance are rigidly demanded in summary all right so inclusion of irrelevant or extraneous and unnecessary material 
in every scoring answer will attract penalty of deduction of one mark. All right. So when there is no conciseness, when there is no relevance, then you are at risk of losing one mark. So you have to be concise. Remember we said conciseness has to do with what? Being short. Relevance, it has to be what was given. Do not give extra information. Whatever answer you're given has to be relevant to what is in the passage. Then we have, in summary, you are expected to write your answers in complete sentences. It has to be in complete sentences. Remember I told you, is that you're using your preamble which read, flows into the sentence, or you write it without your preamble running into the sentences. You, you approach them one after the other, other than writing factors that cause um, maybe uh, the factors that the bar growth in teenagers are, you start outlining them, lack of good food, lack of exercise, that is preamble running into the sentences. But where I don't want to use preambles that will run into the sentences, I could go in this format. One of the factors that cause lack of growth in teenagers is, I will mention, that is a sentence. All right, so please, you must make sure you write your summary in sentences. When a student writes phrases where complete sentences are demanded, the examiner will award half of the full mark. So these are things you must know. Imagine you have six points to write, and of, in all the six points, you are giving phrases other than complete sentences, and each question, each um, answer has two marks. You keep getting one, and that will cause loss of about six marks for you. So you must write in sentences and not in phrases. Remember, phrases are a group of words. They don't have finite verb. They cannot stand on their own and they don't make sense. As a matter of fact, you must write in sentences so as to avoid loss of mark. So where the student uses wrong preamble, which does not flow into the answers, there will be deduction of mark. I've told you that the preamble is a, an introduction a part of the question that is asked, you're using it to introduce your answer. So where the preamble doesn't flow into the answers, it is a problem. I've given two examples or three of them on how your preamble should run into your answers. And if time permits, we could go through one of the summary questions and also see how we are to use our preamble. All right, so writing of two scoring points in one sentence results to just one point. What do we mean by this? You have been asked to give an answer and you, because you feel you have two points there, you give two points. There, nobody will give you extra mark. You have, you have to write two sentences and in two sentences, instead of writing two sentences, you're writing one sentence. But in that one sentence, you're giving two answers in one sentence, it will be termed as one because you've been asked to write in two sentences. Reason why you should itemize your sentences. Use your bullets, use your num numeric uh, numbers, or you use Roman figures. So this is what you have to put at the back of your mind. You are to give two sentences for an equation. Do not put the two sentences together. Sentence one, you give the answer. Sentence two, you give the answer. Then finally, grammatical and expression error results to a loss of mark. Results to a loss of mark, pardon the S there. So grammatical and expression error results to a what? Loss of mark. When you don't use the right expression, when you, you make mistakes in respect to your subject agreeing with the verb, then there will be loss of marks. So once you are asked to write in two sentences, please itemize the two sentences. Don't jump pack the sentences in one uh, as, uh, as one sentence, thinking that the examiner should know that these are two varying points. That will not be allowed. All right, so that is it. We want to look at one of our summary questions. We'll do that quickly, and I will try to give you um, inkling on how to answer it. So we're looking at 2015, right? Let's look at 2015. We'll quickly read the passage 
maybe we'll read a passage once, know what the passage, the, the subject matter of the passage, then look at the question and we will now give a preamble and possibly one point on that. So it says, every normal human being would want to put his or her feet up once in a while and relax. But obviously, one cannot relax all the time. A little work does not kill. Rather, it keeps one active and mentally alert. Some people think that the invention of robots is the best thing that ever happened to man. They are convinced that the invention has saved the day because robots are ideal workers who work without complaining or getting tired. Robots never reveal company secrets for any reason, corruption, fame, or blackmail, whatever. So the admirers of robots think that once a robot is programmed, it can do as sorry do any piece of work with precision, that's with aptness, over a long period without slowing down, getting bored, or even going on break or vacation. Robots can be made to perform any task. They do not grumble, protest, or ask for inducement in, and ask for inducement allowance, overtime, bonuses, or any of the motivations that human beings usually demand. They also work under conditions which human beings would not accept due to either incapability or attitude. All right? One good thing about the robot is that any of its damaged parts can be replaced for work to go on effectively. On the other hand, if a, a human being loses a vital part of the body, that part may not be replaced for work to go on as effectively as before. There is no doubt at all that the robot is useful, but I strongly believe that the human being is more efficient than the robot in many ways. Human beings are sensitive, thinking beings who are flexible and can therefore control their actions. Thus, they can perform more functions than robots. Since human beings can think, discriminate, and make value judgments, they can solve problems on the spur of the moment. The robot, on the other hand, cannot do this because what it has been programmed for is all that is capable of doing. If a robot is wrongly programmed, it will continue to produce the wrong result until its program is corrected. The human being can take the initiative in many things. He can communicate or even call for assistance when need be, which the robot cannot do. The human being can be appealed, the human being can be appealed to to make some crucial changes. He can also learn from observing what goes on and modify what he is doing. It is clear that even though robots are useful, they are deficient in many ways and therefore cannot have an advantage over the human beings. In crisis, the robot cannot face the challenge. It neither reacts nor reflects. All right? So it says the robot is designed and programmed by human beings. How then can the created be superior than the creator? Robots are created to assist human beings and relieve them of some of their burdens, not to take over completely from them. Now, just reading this, one could tell that the subject matter is on what? The robots and the human beings. The importance of robots and that of human beings. Comparing the robots and the human beings. That's the subject matter. Now, let me say, say something. There are certain comprehension passages you will read. You will quickly understand what the passage is all about. In that case, you will go to the question, read the question, then go back to answer. It is not a must you will read three times. Depending on your skill, if you are good at reading and assimilating easily, why delay? You can always answer, then go back and cross-check your work. Now, let's look at the first question here. It says, in three sentences, one for each, state why the admirers of robots think that, remember it says in three sentences, one for each, 
state why the admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings. Now, I want to attempt this question. I will use my preamble. Remember I said the preamble is an introduction. And you pick your preamble from the question that has been asked. The question says, why do admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings? Now, my preamble is this. Admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings because, I will answer my questions, or reasons why admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings are robots, look at the second paragraph I want to answer, you see that it's flowing, reasons why admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings are, one, they they work for a long period of time without slowing down. So in order not to write verbatim, I can always write, they can stay for long in doing a particular work without breaking down or reducing the pace. You see, I'm, there is no pace in this passage. Reducing the pace at which they work, slowing down has to do with reducing your pace, not breaking down. Breaking down is being weak or getting tired. So I'm writing my own, I said, one of the, the reasons why admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings are, one, robots do a whole lot of work without slowing the pace at which they work, unlike human beings. Remember, why do robot, admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient? This is comparison. So you must state the other aspects. So reasons why admirers of robots think that robots are more efficient than human beings are, one, robots take a longer time at working and not slow down the pace at which they work, unlike human beings who could at some point go down at the pace at which they work with. That's point number one. Point number two are, one, human robots do not go on vacation. I will not use vacation. Human robots do not go on leave while in the bid to achieve their work, but humans go on leave. That's, that's just it. So you see that I've been able to answer, we say in three sentences, there is a fourth one, what the third one rather, what is it that robots do that humans don't do? Robots do not murmur, you say grumble. Robots do not murmur, they do not fight or engage in acts of refusal, unlike the human being. So you see we've been able to answer these questions using my own words. I've been able to answer these questions using my own words. So that way I would like you to attempt questions on summary and see how much you've learned by choosing your own words while attempting the questions. All right. Thank you and have a nice day.